Let's rock and roll, boys. Hello and welcome to another Nintendo podcast. I'm your host for this evening, Austin Cummings, and I am joined by the one, Danny Tortelli. The one. <laughs> Just the one. Just the one. <laughs> the one, one wonderful dude. Um, listeners, viewers, we come to you tonight uh, we, through, we're, now we're missing Matt, so it's just Danny and I. And because of that, Matt is our video guru. And so Danny and I spent a great deal of time figuring out how to record in Skype with a split screen. We think we got there, but if you're listening to the video right now and there's no video at all, then we didn't get there. Um, but hey, we're happy, we're happy to be here with you. And now, the concept behind tonight's episode is this. Danny, there are certain times pegged throughout human history that really define history as a, as a whole. Landmark moments that I think we'll look back on in our later years and reflect as the times that everything changed. We think of 1969, the moon landing. We think of 2008, the election of this country's first black president. We think of 2019 on February uh, 13th, when we had this very, very nice uh, Nintendo Direct that we got earlier today at 2 p.m. Pacific time. And we want to come kind of an emergency podcast and, and chat about it a little bit. Just kind of see, kind of pick each other's brains, chat about what we liked and what we thought was missing. We'd like to see in the future. Yeah. And uh, before we do, though, Danny, is there maybe a little someone we want to give a little special shout out to? Yes, we want to give a little special <laughs> shout out to Gloria. Uh, <laughs> Great. Gloria Redmond Booth. <laughs> Uh, we just want to officially apologize mm -hmm. on the ANP uh, I, I, emergency episode saying you are not a bot and we do welcome bot. your viewership right. uh, and you are one of our most uh, cherished. So. <laughs> and, and I want to say even if you were a bot, you'd still be welcome. Bots are very welcome on ANP. We love Chibi Robo. We love Rob, the robot, robot operating buddy. We like also Rob who runs the great Fox in Star Fox. <laughs> Two different Nintendo. Oh, good, good luck, luck Fox. Fox. Great Fox is okay. Glory, thank you for listening. Mom, thanks for listening. King D, thank you. As always, we appreciate your your viewership. Uh, tonight, Danny, break us, break us down a little bit. Big picture. What did we see through today's Nintendo Direct on February 13th? Uh, and what are kind of the highlights? If you were to give it a score, a five-point scale with no halves, you know, I'm very passionate about this, where would you go ahead and rank the, the show we saw today? So, since we're not doing halves... I'm going to go towards the lower end. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to go with a three out of five. Not a not a bad three. That's that's a happier three. But mm -hmm. uh, it's still Happy a three. Still a three. Got it. Yeah. I, well, I kind of have a funny, I feel like, reaction whenever I view Nintendo Direct, which is I go through a similar set of emotions that I kind of express to my colleagues. And it goes a little something like this. It always starts out, um, and I'm so excited for it. I get the Twitter alerts, my my Twitch uh, notification through my phone. I'm, I'm also the Twitch I've developed while waiting for this thing to happen. <laughs> uh, the, the, that compulsion I have in my, in my hand, just shaking, uh, shaking it. And so I am, I look forward to it. I'm very eager. And then I watched Nintendo direct and it is just announcement after announcement, no matter how mundane, you know, we have mortal Kombat in this and I'm not mortal Kombat dude, but even so seeing it re you know, presented in such a format, it's an exciting time. So I come off the direct, no matter how it was, Totally pumped. Call up my buddies or text them, and I'm like, did you guys watch the direct? And they're always like, no. They don't care about as much as I do. I, mainly as Danny. <laughs> but a lot of times I'll, I'll ask and I'll say, did you watch it? And they'll be like, what, what got announced? And I'll be like, uh, well, I guess we got some release dates. I mean, there really wasn't like a ton of new stuff out of this, um, as yeah. there really never are. But then again, Nintendo does sprinkle these on an early recording. Danny, you had mentioned before we scrapped that version of this podcast that this has been a long time since we had a direct. Yeah, since Nintendo started doing directs, this has been the longest stretch of time between directs. Because um, mm -hmm. the last one was the last Smash uh, direct uh, yeah. before the, the end of the 2018. So um, mm -hmm. it's been a while. So any direct would have been a good direct. So we're welcome to. to Absolutely. Yeah, we're happy to we're happy to be here to chat about it. Just nice to get something. 
Uh, but I would say, yeah, not a lot of big announcements, but still kind of things worth talking about. So for this maybe shorter episode, Danny, let's break down kind of our top three items each going from our third most excited leading to the ultimate uh, excitement announcement from today. Do you want to kick us off? Yeah, absolutely. So my top three, um, I feel like most of them are just updates to current games. Um, you know, learning more, obviously, Smash stuff is coming. Um, they teased 3.0 is coming out within the next month or two, um, which is crazy because mm-hmm. um, we just got 2.0 like a few weeks ago. Um, <laughs> it's funny. I just really j- jump in here quickly. But yeah, they say like oh, 3.0 is coming and it is exciting because whenever anything gets a big update, it's like, oh, you know, it's OS 12, you know, uh, iOS 12, you'll get like a lot of new features. Watch OS, you know, uh, oh gosh, four, whatever we're on now, you know, he has the uh, EKG and all these new right. uh, advanced. It feels like a really big change, but the Switch, especially like the Switch, uh, the, the just the firmware of the console, it's like we're already on six, but like had nothing really different than five. Like it does, it's totally meaningless. It does not have the same pe- punch. And yet they kind of present it as if it does. Right. It's like 3.0 is coming soon. No details today, but there's going to be some good stuff. Like, why even bother with that? Um, Smash was the one kind of noticeably absent, but we'll get to our one disappointment later. Right now, it's our three most exciting things. So continue. Sure. Uh, um, certainly learning as far as more updates to existing games. Um, a favorite among uh, the ANP crew is the updates to Starlink. That's getting uh, another uh, batch of DLC, which... Mm-hmm makes it even more so uh you know the whole rest of the Star Fox team are gonna be playable characters they won't just be chiming in every now and then um so you want to play as peppy slippy falco you got it uh still no crystal yep. but you can uh they are bringing in the rest of the wolf team too um you got leon you got pigma mm-hmm. and you got and gris uh, panther right no is not panther uh andros's where, nephew where is he Oh no! Is it Andrew? Is it is it Andrew Andros's like nephew or something like that? Andros's enemy is my enemy. That would be a strange naming convention for that family, where they're like we all go for names based on your uncle that start with A. You know, but his it is mom, Andrea. Something. You know, like it's <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So the way the prophecy foretold. Right. Um. The yeah. Good question. I assumed Panther was in it, but I guess I guess not. That's too bad. But I know what you mean, because he's always like, Uncle Andros, when you defeat him. Uncle Andros! Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, uh, but he's a good character. Yeah, right, on. right, right. Yeah, he's, he's so crummy, but always good to beat. So they're, <laughs> they're all coming in. So you're getting some more wolf, like, side storyline stuff, because he's still part of the team. And they, they hinted that war, wolf has more, like, up his sleeve and stuff. Um, looks like they're adding some new, like, map locations, because it looked like there was, like, some ships some big ships I didn't recognize before that you're like zooming yeah. over. Um, they're adding some, oddly enough, some racing aspects to this. Uh, um, I know, very strange. Do we think there's any chance that is like part of like the retro leak or not really leak, but rumor that they were making a Star Fox racing game? Was that somebody just like getting their crosshairs in a in a in a crossed hair and they somehow interpreted this? My first that? thought was when I saw that like little racing feature. I'm mm-hmm. like, oh the team at Retro just got Metroid Prime handed to them, and they're like, oh, shoot, Ubisoft, here. <laughs> t- t- take this Star Fox <laughs> racing concept we have. Put it out for free. It's half done. <laughs> right. um, yeah, I, I will say that like a message of this Direct was really like a lot of free content coming to games that are already out. Yeah. Even Captain Toad Treasure Tracker, you know, a Still Wii U game more. that was... Yeah. I was amazed by that. Yeah, it's getting even some paid DLC content as well as free co-op, Crazy. which is... Totally wild. Like, that's a game I have on Wii U and I also got on Switch. Like, I'm going to finish it this time on Switch. Did I? No. But I wasn't, like, totally surprised it would get more content. Um, In the same vein as, like, if they were to release Tropical Freeze content, it'd be a big surprise. Um, But I really, you know, have liked that approach they've had to their games. It's been really nice to see that support. I hope we see that support for Super Mario Party at some point. Yeah. But, yeah, I thought this Starlink one was, like, really exciting, especially for a game... I feel like, you know, the enthusiasm is low. We just recently released an episode where we talked about Starlink and we liked it. We have thoughts for a sequel and we'll continue to talk about it. But, 
It's a game I see routinely, you know, on sale or it's half off or the physical edition is like $30 with all the figures. So I was really surprised uh, not only to see content, but also to learn that it was going to be free. I figured yeah. they'd try to like make up some costs. So it makes me think that it performed at least well enough that they'd be willing to either get people to interested to buy it who are on the fence or support the people who have already come out to buy the game at full retail price, um, or at least in these first few months. So um, that was exciting. I was actually very excited about that. Yeah, for sure. This now makes me think that this is as much of a Star Fox game as it is not a Star Fox game. You know, we've talked about yeah. before, is it just a game that has Star Fox in it? Like now I'm like, this is like a 50-50 it is or it isn't. <laughs> It also makes the other versions like very strange, like PlayStation and Xbox, who do not have like some expansive. Like this seems to be like it'll, it's a whole. I don't think we're gonna, you know, a ton of story content, but there's at least cutscenes that feature those characters because mm -hmm. we saw them, and you can play as the mm -hmm. all members of Star Fox, the four of them, in the campaign for Fox's missions, and kind of based on their treatment of Fox in the rest of Starlink, it makes me think, you know, they will also have unique lines of dialogue. You know, I'm sure they won't be placed in the pre-rendered cinematics, right. but they will certainly be chatting quite a bit. And those Star Fox characters love to chat. And that means like a whole host of new dialogue where they say like, well, you know, this isn't my system, but I'm happy to be here to help. And right. um, so I, that's like a really impressive attention to detail. When it, you saw Star Wolf's team, they looked awesome. Like it really feels like a full Star Fox game to the extent of, like we talked about in episode 27, I would like, you want to see Ubisoft handle uh, the Toronto team or whichever Ubisoft team uh, took it on, handle their own Star Fox game, or at least like, you know, Star Fox colon Starlink 2, you know, something along those right. lines, because it, it is getting to that point where it's a lot of Fox, <laughs> which I'm all for. Right. I wonder if they're just going to be like, you know what, screw the Star Fox racing game, screw a like standalone Star Fox game. We're just going to keep, Nintendo's just going to keep dropping a couple bucks to ubisoft every like six months and be like just add some more fox dlc it, by the time this thing this ship is finished <laughs> it'll be a full star fox game i know honestly they'll be all yeah it, they'll be andros in there. there's no we'll have gone to soria um you know visit tricky like gone to the little shop um they'll be there yeah they'll all be there right. my dear friends yeah i was i think that was actually a highlight for me during the uh during the show today but i'm gonna bring up another one so all right. my all right third most anticipated game uh, today was one of the surprise announcements. Now, the Nintendo Direct was hosted by Koizumi, who has done the previous uh, Directs as well. He was there for the launch of the Switch, mm -hmm. uh, which was fun. He was the Deputy General Manager mm -hmm. of uh, Nintendo's uh, Entertainment Planning and Development Team. He previously worked on Nintendo. I know these things because I looked him up briefly for the to do this really painstaking research we do for a and And I got to say, as a side note, uh, Koizumi has aged extremely well like go back and look at younger photos of him which are fine but like he th that is a sharp looking man when he was up there presenting the hd rumble and feeling those cubes in the joy con you know but two years ago he was selling it then and let me tell you he's selling that <laughs> good looking sharp dude so hats off to him okay so the game i want to feature uh for my third most excited game from the direct is astral chain so that's a platinum okay. games okay. game that was announced and you know out of nowhere platinum games has assisted Nintendo for Star Fox Zero, but mainly is known for their their work uh, with the Bayonetta franchise mm -hmm. and the Vanquish franchise. They made Mad World on the Wii, a game I really enjoyed. Uh, but previously, the Platinum Games was, was responsible for Clover Studios. That was, uh, for that, they made the very good games such as Okami, uh, God Hand, things of that nature. But in any event, uh, Hideki Kamiya is one of the leads at Platinum. His name is attached to this uh, project. And it, what it looks like is it looks very vanquishy, very fast moving, metro kind of urban setting. These characters that are seemingly cops, the flying around these stages with these chains and kind of dog, uh, kind of very robotic, almost Beast Wars looking creatures. Right. They're fighting. It also has a very vanquished feel, which is a game on 360 and PS3 I really enjoyed. It's just it's over the top action game that has all these very silly, uh, just like Platinum Games, Metal Gear Rising, Revengeance back on mm -hmm. last gen consoles. But it's like the the president's the bad guy. You gotta think about all your social roles and like what politics says for you know, like says for the people and the mouthpiece. Like it's it has like these very like 
high concept delivered very poorly like themes throughout them, but it just creates like this very fun, uh, like vibrant, nonstop craziness that really fuels like the best platinum games, which are like Bayonetta over the top. Yeah. So Astral Chain is definitely based into that mold. Excited for that. Nice. Comes out this summer. Nice. Yeah. That one did definitely looked interesting and worth checking out. They put up all the previews um, for the new announcements uh, they put up on, U- on Nintendo's YouTube page. Um, you know, each one's like a minute, minute and a half. So definitely worth checking out for sure. Yeah. A weird one of the few new games, you know, really, truly new games that we hadn't known about was this one. And I'm yeah excited about it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, going through the list, um, we'll do more in depth through the whole list on a whole nother show. We can bring Matt back. Um, from his val- from his Valentine's Day hangover. Um, yeah, we mentioned Captain Toad, Treasure Tracker, Damon X Machina. I like that update. Um, mm-hmm. They said, you know, it's still going. It's still developing. It's still on time. Um, so much to the point that they're ready to start. Essentially, they didn't say it, but beta testing. Um, live today, um, they had some, like, uh, uh, trial, like, um, yeah. playthroughs, um, some demo stuff. There it is. Um, so they want fans to start playing it to give them some feedback. Um, and so they can kind of get some data recorded too on what they just should, uh, fine tune before the big yeah. And you know, games like Octopath Traveler by Square Enix, they did this mm-hmm. too, where they're like, Hey, put it out. We're going to send you a survey. I did, I did it for Octopath and really enjoyed it. It's a great way to get people oh, talking you, about did it. Did, it you also have, shows... did they give you the survey? I haven't received the survey yet, but I did download it. Okay. Uh, the prototype mission for Damon X Machina. They're going to send that, and, they're going to uh, send that any day now. <laughs> Any minute. I, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure they really want to hear from me. They know I'm on AMP. They want to get my like, kind of level influencers like ourselves. Yeah. Um, but it shows they have a lot of confidence in this game, which is great because it is it's a mech game. It's strange mm-hmm. looking anime mm-hmm. characters. It looks complicated. Um, and I think it's a good way to kind of get it into people's hands. Maybe it'll just get people chatting about it, have it develop a comfort level for it, kind of build the hype because it came out as the first thing announced at E3 last year for them. Mm-hmm. That was a bit of a random one, but yes, looking forward to that. Is that your second most anticipated game? I would say so. I, I would put the the Starlink and the Smash Bros like updates as one <laughs> poll. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, basically non update update for Smash. Bros. Right, right. Um, trying to go through the rest of them. You know, uh, Marvel Ultimate Alliance was another big one. Um, just yeah, just good to see more footage of it. Um, was a little disappointed. Didn't see Black Panther yet. They're like, you'll. Oh, interesting. And I'm like, you know what? I know you're developing this like a year ago. Did you Did you see the box office returns? Like, I'm hoping you I'm hoping you saw that. Um, right. No, uh, you'd think so, especially because the way they framed that trailer was like, you all know Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel. She's very powerful, and she her powers take flight. Literally, her flight powers in this game. Like, it was very specific and kind of a. Like, I was surprised to see how on the nose it was for a game that's already based around Infinity War and the Black Order in terms of, like, thematics. Right. So I liked and also thought it was kind of funny, like, the emphasis on Carol Danvers. It seems like they did certainly no mistake the timing of this game. Um, and I'm, yeah, looking looking forward to it. I have an affection for the previous two, uh, but it was fun. Nice. Yeah, so uh, what what about, what else for you? Uh, I feel okay, like so I, if I'm going... Yeah. If I'm going for my top three, number two of them would be uh, the Fire Emblem Three Houses. Yeah. So just to talk about this for a second. We have talked about it in the pod before, and I know we got some haters here who don't want to see any more Fire Emblem characters. It's okay, Matt's not here. We don't need to worry games. about it. <laughs> yeah, just you and me, two <laughs> Fire Emblem enthusiasts. Yeah. But, um, so it's coming out July 26th, which technically is a slight delay, but it doesn't feel like it. And just uh, Danny and I are referencing the Kotaku article, all the news from February 2019. So check out that article on Kotaku for a good breakdown as well. But basically the Fire Emblem trailer got me really excited. We hadn't seen a lot from this game. Um, I really love Fire Emblem. Talked about it when we talked about Wargroove last week. Mm -hmm. But I love just the characters that come out of these these games that all have such distinct personalities. A lot of them fall into kind of trope categories to some degree, but there's always really interesting costuming and powers based around each hero. And such that even though there are kind of a lot of maybe generic anime characters uh, on display, the way in which they all interact as a party and you pair them up yourselves in the 3DS games uh, just really brings out a lot of fun dynamics that really let those kind of immediately recognizable kind of archetypes really shine in combination. And so this game is our first time seeing how this one's gonna be set up. Now, Fire Emblem Fates back on the 3DS, uh, to really experience that full story, you had to buy basically three versions of the game, where you chose one path, the second path, and then like kind of the working with both sides, the um, 
of both Birthright and Conquest in order to see the like true ending. Mm -hmm. In any event, it was like $100 of 3DS game just to get to experience that. This game, oh now though there is a collector's edition, um, there's three, the three houses are basically different schools, kind of a la Hogwarts and feel. Um, like this is the Black Eagles, for instance. And the, you kind of align with one of them to mainly like raise those students up to make them kind of your disciples and you're in this kind of neutral kingdom amongst three neighboring countries. And, um, but in any event, I was just excited to, to see that, to see that choice. Cause also it makes me think then that when I experience the game, you could choose one and then choose one of the other two for a subsequent playthrough, maybe on hard or with different limitations uh, to, you know, figure out different, uh, to experience those different sets of classmates and characters and whatnot. And that's, that's fun. Now there's kind of two big questions I have about this game. It's definitely my most anticipated game. Um, I'm putting it as my number two for the sake of, of this, but kind of big picture, I would say, uh, generally speaking for the Switch, very excited for Fire Emblem. Mm. My two big questions are though, the protagonist shown, correct me if I'm wrong, Danny, only male is only one shown. And um, which would be new because for Awakening, Robin, who you played as, could be male or female, as expressed in Smash Bros. And Corrin in Fates had a male and female. And a lot of people kind of see the female Corrin as the more definitive. She kind of had just a little more distinct personality. And when you're playing through the game multiple times, it's fun to play, you know, as the other gender because they have different romantic options. Mm -hmm. And that's my second question is, we don't know exactly w to what length will the relationship thing be built out. I do also see like a little bit of a funkiness that I'm sure Fire Emblem will not treat with any real grace where it's like you're technically all these people's teacher and it's like, you know, there's already that like setup, which is kind of present in the other games where you're, you know, you're the leader and everyone's like to some degree like interested in you by default. And of course, because it's also video games, but right. um, you know, but that also this also has like kind of the training uh, dynamic, which is a little funky, but I would like to see you know, that not just for the player character, but the other classmates and stuff to pair up those units. The other games have introduced children, where if you pair up the units, there's like a time warp essential, essentially in the story that then the children come from the future back to help. And then they have traits based on the parents that you've paired, um, which is fun. And they even look, their appearance somewhat is affected by the pa color palette of the one of the parents. And so in any event, I really like those mechanics a lot in Fire Emblem. We didn't really see those yet. But this is our first taste of the game, but it does come out in July. So I hope they don't leave that behind because even in my last little detail on this is in Fire Emblem Echoes on 3DS, which was a remake of an early Fire Emblem game that we did not get in the United States. In that game, they even featured uh, the sum element of those relationships, not nearly as built out as the other games, but you still units would have special dialogue if you trained with them together and they just kind of added that extra layer to an older game which makes me think they would apply it fully for a new game again so i hope they do i hope to see it and i thought it presented really well i'm very excited about this game man you really got a you got a good knowledge a lot on, of thoughts. on fire emblem very good no one will listen to me talk about fire emblem and i need this platform <laughs> to do it i'm cutting the rest of the episode it's only gonna be talking about fire emblem that's the episode cut it matt's not here anyway. i gotta capitalize while i can <laughs> This is my Fire Emblem time, and he knows I need this, and he always denies it for me. Um, okay, uh, Danny, yeah. what is your most anticipated game from the Direct today, February 13th, 2019? Here we go! I, I can't believe I'm going to say this. Oh, no. I think it might be Link's Awakening. Oh, yeah! Wow, what a The, wish the remaster. <laughs> um, this it is, looks good. Because... And I, I, I think that is a genuine shocker because, again, Breath of the Wild is the first Zelda game I've actually played uh, right. start to yeah. finish. We'll cut, and, we'll, and we'll cut that for sure, but keep going. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so when they first started showing it, I was like, I feel like I've heard that title from like my roommates the past couple years like and like other Nintendo fans. I'm like, mm -hmm. why have I known mm -hmm. that title? But all this gameplay looks like so fresh and so brand new. Um, I'm like, right. it literally looks like they're doing, you know, there's all these rumors of, Will they announce another Zelda game? Will it be like the Majora's Vast Mask version of Breath of the Wild? Like blah blah blah. Yeah. Will they do another 2D like top down or 2D like side scroller Zelda game? You know, like they'll go like back and forth. Um and it literally looked like they made a as I was watching it, I'm like, it's a 3D 2D top down side scroller. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um yeah. and they're like, yeah, it's a remaster of the game from 26 years ago on the first Game Boy. Um and I was just like, wait, that was a Goomba. Wait, that was 
chain chomp. I'm like, yeah. was this? Yeah. I and again, so I never played this on Game Boy, so I was just like amazed, and I'm like, I might find myself getting suckered into this. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a funny game to feature on the Switch, and I'm I'm glad for it. I didn't see it coming, but we had heard rumors of the 2D, you know, Zelda for a long time, and a link between worlds on 3DS was excellent as the successor to a link to the past. Um but this game is funny because when it came out back in 93, it was came out as kind of a proof of concept to take Link's Awakening from the Super Nintendo and adapt it for Game Boy. Mm -hmm. And as such, it has the kind of this weird Game Boy flair that a lot of those games had at the time where it has like little Mario references and whatnot. Um, you know, it's a smaller game, but still sufficiently long. Uh, you know, probably somewhere around a dozen or so uh, hours. But the it it's a funny game because it was made to be like, hey, could console games work on Game Boy format? And now we have the Switch, which is a merger of the two, so that's kind of moot. Um, but it is, a, whoa, think about it, look at us now, 2019. <laughs> but um, yeah, really, I'm excited about that. And I like that, honestly, you know, that it's a remaster, which does seem like a little bit of cop-out. We have so many remasters this day and age, but truly to have it as a full remake, I guess, unless they're just a glossy remaster, that something I like about this is that... Uh, it kind of, I think, for Nintendo, it's going to be up there, you know, it's on the eShop next to Breath of the Wild, you know, when people search for it. It's on the same platform, which is great about the Switch. But I think this kind of keeps the focus and the momentum for new Zelda on Breath of the Wild. I think it makes a statement that this is like a classic revisiting of a great format of Zelda. I love top-down Zelda games of yesteryear, mm -hmm. but it still shows that they're focused on Breath of the Wild. I know we've talked on the podcast before, both with Breath of the Wild 2, a game that uses you know, the engine, they've kind of, without having to reinvent the wheel, but uses all the great things about Breath of the Wild in the same way that Majora's Mask did something creative with the Ocarina of Time engine. Mm. I, um, so I think that was a nice, like, my interpretation of that is that they're saying, hey, we know people want to play this type of game. Here's a remake of classic, but they still have people focused on making a brand new Zelda, you would have to assume. So, yeah. um, in any event, and I thought it looked really good. Like, so... In A Link Between Worlds, the model for Link was based off the old A Link to the Past Link, who looked like very kind of elf, uh, kind of Tolkien elf dwarf-ish right. looking character model. Um, and it was fun to see him brought back for that game in a more contemporary setting, but also he looked very goofy, um, which is also kind of fun. But uh, I didn't find the game visually to be that, like, that pretty. It was it's cute, but um, I didn't always think all the character models worked. I really like the way that Zelda looks in Ultimate. She's based off of her uh, character model from A Link Between Worlds, and it looks really cute. Like, she looks cute, not goofy, necessarily. Mm -hmm. And I liked that about that change, and I feel like they're doing the same thing for this. Like, Link, if you look at his model, he looks a lot more, like, chibi-looking, big, right. kind of bigger head, soft features. Right. Um, he still has, like, the big, kind of mutton choppish cyber and things, but it's like, his just looks, his face, he just looks rounder and cuter. Um, and it looks like, it reminded me of Octopath Traveler a bit because it was like, here's a classic looking game, but it has all this HD shine and effects. So you have like these little chibi, almost kind of like play school toy models. And then it's like, yeah. but really beautiful HD graphics and like fog effects and like right. everything looks like it's like polished to a shine because it's shining. I, I liked the look of it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this could be, uh, I know a ton of people loved, uh, you know, this game, um, obviously you're reading the news and stuff, uh, and it was, a lot of people regard it as still the best Zelda, um, you know, even still beating out Breath of the Wild. Um, yeah, probably generous, but I think people have a, a soft spot in their heart, especially because people our generation yeah. started with the Game Boy, yeah. you know, and I got my first Game Boy in 95 or 96, and um, so I remember when I got my Game Boy Color, Link's Awakening was one of those games because Link's Awakening DX came out, which is kind of the director's cut right. edition that had color as well as fixed, like a traversal bug, obviously. But um, it had true, like, cutscene uh, images mm -hmm. that were panels. But, um, and so I associated with that. I think a lot of people have it's the same way people love the first Pokemon generation because it hit that kind of certain part of their life. And uh, yeah. in any event, I think Zelda's come a long way since then, but this will be a great way to read it. Yeah, for sure. So, Austin, what was your biggest surprise oh, was it Danny was it this boy. game was it uh you know getting Honestly, back to zelda let me tell you my most anticipated thing out of the direct might be a weird one uh for most people but dragon quest 11 s really excited about it now i really love the dragon quest series talked about it a lot on in the past um and builders 2 is coming out as well but what i loved about this is dragon quest 11 came out 
last fall on PS4 and Steam. Yeah. And it's a great game. It looks amazing. Um, beautiful culmination of this iconic RPG franchise that really defined that entire JRPG genre. But a big thing that held it back was the music was really grating. It used the chip tunes basically from the original games for all the music. Um, Koichi Sugiyama. The composer, whose name I'll drop into this if I'm getting it wrong, yeah. um, he like has a lot of troubling views, but he's an older guy that's associated with the franchise, and they kind of... He's one of the three main Dragon Quest leads, developed by Yuji Horii, Akira Toriyama for the art, just like Dragon Ball, and Koichi Sugiyama for the music. The game did not have really any new music. It was all this old stuff, which was like nostalgic and fun for a few minutes, and then the game's like 80 hours, and it's like, wow. I can't listen to this dungeon theme mm -hmm. like played through MIDI the entire time. So it's getting orchestral remaster as well as 8-bit retro graphics that when Dragon Quest XI came out a few years ago in Japan, it came out on 3DS as well as PS4. In 3DS version, you could switch between modern looking 3DS versions of the graphics and 8-bit graphics. We never got that here. This game's gonna feature it. So it's honestly like, a, and it looks awesome on the Switch, even if not quite as popping as the PS4 version. Really is like the definitive version of this game. I did not finish it on PS4, knowing the Switch version was coming. Figured that would be a good time. Yeah. And it makes it me feel like very worth the wait on that one. So very excited about that. Thought it was a nice way to repackage that game because Switch owners will be waiting about a year after the US release of Dragon Quest XI. So right. thought that was pretty good. Uh, Danny, let's kind of close this out by talking about the things that weren't here. So we're each going to choose one thing that was a little bit of disappointment. Ooh. All right. Um, and go ahead. I'm uh, the the biggest thing, and I will, we'll maybe share like the other things we were disappointed about in our next show. Um, the Spyro stuff. I mean, we've we've oh, yeah. <laughs> more leaks uh, popping up in the news lately about Spyro mo mm -hmm. moving to Switch. And again, that that jump started my creativity again of like oh great not only is the spyro trilogy finally coming to switch but they're going to announce him as one of the next final dlc characters for smash it's all coming yeah. together the moons are aligning um and nothing about it and i'm right. just kind of getting bummed out why they're like being all coy about it um sure so many big retailers and nintendo themselves have leaked it on their own site over the past year year and a half <laughs> i don't know why right. they're just hiding from it if it's up and running already on the other two yeah. consoles. Maybe they're working with Virtuos and they're trying to get it just, you know, mastered for Switch, you know, because of the graphics power is different or something. So that yeah. was my biggest disappointment. How about you? Uh, I would say, you know, the funny thing about this is, and we didn't talk about this yet on the podcast, but basically before this direct, there was a leak posted on um, Resetra where basically one of the users who's correctly predicted things in the past that there's going to be a direct on the 13th mm -hmm. ended up being true. And that games featured for it were going to be Mario Maker 2, which was announced, we haven't talked about. Yeah. Um, and that there was going to be 2D Zelda, also true. Mm -hmm. The other games that he said were, were coming were Pikmin 3 remaster from Wii U game, did not see that. Yeah. Um, as well as, and for me, Metroid Prime Trilogy. So the fact that yeah. he was right or she on so many of these other details makes me think those games are real. And even this leaker had said it wasn't necessarily like for sure going to be in this direct. But the fact that all those other details were correct makes me think that those things will come just be revealed at a later time. Mm -hmm. It's something I always try to like kind of hedge my review of the directs and my personal feelings is like, this is like a little present we get basically 10 or so times in the year. Other companies don't do this. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to always like, you know, try to be a little lenient with Nintendo that sometimes we're just going to get dates in one or two things. And we got to keep things in perspective. But I think those games probably will come the rest of those predictions being correct, especially the date guess, yeah. make me think it's got to be real. So uh, we talked about Metroid Prime Trilogy and its delay in a previous episode. And that hopefully, I'm sorry, Metroid Prime 4's delay. And we're, right. we talked about the fact that Trilogy, hopefully, um, will then get a remaster on the Switch to kind of tie fans over. My conspiracy theory is that it's coming. But we believe Retro, as it was announced, is just starting on this game. And this will be the first time that Metroid Prime has shown up on a console that had twin sticks. Um, mm. Because Metroid Prime, the first one, you had to stop and aim, pulling down the R button, uh, and then hitting A to shoot as Samus on the GameCube. And then 
for the trilogy or Metro Prime 3 and then the trilogy on, on the Wii, you had pointer controls, which were awesome, but those will not be implemented on the Switch because you just can't do that without the IR. So there's actually a lot of mechanics that they'll have to, so, for whenever this exactly. comes out, that they have to redo. They're going to tw tweak it a bit, and I bet they are going to want to wait to sh like probably show off that button layout and everything so people can play the trilogy and then move right into four and have it be like a seamless, you know, transition. Um, since right now it's like a pretty formidable, uh, you know, I'm sure challenge to adapt those things perfectly in the way they would like to see it uh, adapted. So I, my guess is that's why they're waiting. Yeah. Um, but I would hope we get it announced that it comes out sometime this year. I wish the direct, my last little mini disappointment, you know, there wasn't really any moment in the direct where there was like a big, and it comes out today, right? We got some demos, like you mentioned. Right. There, typically they do, like throw us like something like that. Like we got Hollow Knight like that or, um, or something along those lines. Into the Breach was that way. And, mm -hmm. um, where they just had re releases that were pretty immediate. Not really seeing that this one. Uh, I always think it's really fun. It would have been nice if Box Boy had been that, but, um, it wasn't, which is okay. Overall, though, still, I'm grateful to get the direct. Yeah. And um, I thought it was a, you know, a good time. I'm happy for it. And I'm happy for you, it's... Danny, and for uh, A&P and Gloria and Mother and King D to be joining us to talk a little bit about it and for listening to this uh, episode. Is there anything else you want to say as we kind of close out? No. Oh, yeah. We will uh, keep everything up to date as we can with the next couple directs that are sure are coming. Some certainly big announcements on their way over the next month or so. Um, and we'll do a more further in-depth breakdown with uh, Loverboy on uh, Sunday or another day or something like that. So um, Very good. thank you for Ridiculous. listening. Thank you, Austin. Always great. Uh, near and far, mostly far. <laughs> Always great. Really far, together. never near. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you, Danny. I, I, I agree. I'm happy to be here. Happy to be here recording from this, this little hotel room. Happy to be here on YouTube.com. Assuming this video recorded properly and the audio and this actually goes up. Otherwise, it was just fun to chat with you. And if it did go up, thank you for listening, and we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. Good luck. Get to the pond, Froggy. Uncle Andros! Ah! Grease.